So good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, um, Eartha Org, an online conversation with uh, John O'Sullivan. I am, uh, my name is Olivia Lai, the managing editor at Eartha Org. I'll be your host at tonight's event, which is brought to you by the Hive Co-working Spaces, a place where passionate and entrepreneurial people can get together and share ideas while growing their businesses. The Hive has location in Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, Australia, Singapore, and Taiwan. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Um, John is an impact NFT specialist uh, working with Project Arc, which is an innovative blockchain powered conservation platform that offers NFT artwork and which directly funds wildlife and environmental conservation efforts from around the world. He has helped launch a number of NFT, uh, impact NFT art exhibitions and auctions in different countries, including here in Hong Kong and just recently Miami uh, in, in 2021 alone. So before we start, um, I want to remind our audience that there'll be a Q&A session at the end. Um, uh, so make sure to pop your questions in the chat box in Zoom here, or if you're on Hive Country pages on Facebook, we will make sure to field them uh, to John right here. So John, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's exciting to always talk about the work and the space in general. Absolutely. Um, so before we dive into the world of impact NFT, um, let's get to the basic first. Um, if you can explain a little bit what actually NFTs are uh, for those who are unfamiliar with it and you know, why is it suddenly so popular and trending right now? So I think that there's a lot of misconceptions and you know uh, what they call FUD in the space that is uh, misleading people. I think that um, it's much more than a JPEG, right? You have to think of NFTs simply as a digital contract. Anything can be an NFT. Um, you can NFT, you know, physical labels that a corporation has to actually track in the supply chain to ensure that there's consumer protection and no knockoffs. There's, there's a multitude of things. Now, um, what we view NFTs as being as is, is a really wonderful vehicle for not only diversifying the income streams for a lot of these impact projects around the world, but also changing the narrative. Right. There's a, there's something that I like to say, and that's that, you know, art, art can be political. Money is power. When you put them together, you have a movement. And with mm -hmm. NFTs come this community that is often very galvanized, very, um, very motivated, very passionate around an issue or around a cause or around, you know, a specific drop is what they call them in the NFT world when you release your, your NFT drop. And mm -hmm. so not only does it diversify your income, it also helps um, change the narrative. Right. I think that guilt has been the, the motivating factor for a lot of impact organizations saying, you know, well, this is a problem, we have to solve it, and, you know, you're bad if you don't. It's not the most motivating factor, though, right? And so NFTs can be, um, you know, music, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. It can be very experiential and immersive. And so if you are able to actually, you know, provide an experience for somebody that they're getting, you know, real-world value and utility and education out of, um, you know, they're far more apt to want to, to, to be involved with it. And so I think that NFTs are definitely in a transitionatory period for the next couple of years. We are still far away from mass adoption, but with, you know, big companies like Facebook and everyone piling in on the space, it's, it's inevitable, right? We're only growing more attached to our digital identities and our phones than we are less. And so um, we're very excited to sort of be, you know, one of the first in the space to really leveraging this specifically for, you know, making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think what people are probably most confused about how NFTs are related with uh, cryptocurrency or anything to do with um, blockchain uh, technology. Maybe you can help kind of, you know, uh, die, uh, you know, explain a little of the process, what the, all the components that put together work. Yeah, exactly. So, so the blockchain is just a distributed ledger system that is unhackable. What that means is that if I have 1 million computers that confirm a transaction or a piece of information, it's unhackable. You can't hack a million computers, right? So that's what, and it's, it's incredibly transparent and therefore, you know, there's more accountability in essence, right? This is as, as the space progresses, but mm -hmm. an NFT, uh, what a non-fungible means is that it's not exchangeable for any one equal thing. One, if I give you a dollar and you give me a dollar, we still both have a dollar, it's, but that, yeah. that makes it fungible, right? Um, the NFT itself is encoded on the blockchain uh, as a smart contract that is verified and viewed by everyone. So that's another very interesting aspect for funding of these impact organizations. You can track dollar to dollar where it is spent and how it is spent, which is such a big thing for so many people because, um, you know, as we all know, the narrative that people say, well, you know, I'm giving a dollar and 80 cents goes to A, B, and C that didn't actually fight the end impact. But um, the space itself, 
uh, for blockchain, there's there's a big debate um, in the emissions question, right? Which is what mm -hmm. we're here to talk about predominantly. And that is proof of work versus proof of stake. And the best way I can describe proof of work, which is what Bitcoin and Ethereum is on, is that if you want to prove a bit of information on the ledger, it's like 14 computers all rev up. They're called miners. They're racing to prove this one thing. And then whoever wins gets it. But 14 mm -hmm. computers still did the work, which causes more emissions drawdown. But proof of stake, which is where everyone is going, Ethereum 2.0 will be on proof of stake. Um, in when, we don't know. The timeline changes all the time. It's an incredibly complex endeavor. But Tezos, Cardano, Algorand, Binance, um, all of the other major chains are on proof of stake or, and are heading to proof of stake. So that will only be one computer and it's 99.8% less emissions. Therefore, we're probably making more emissions on this you know, Zoom call than we are actually creating a smart contract. So um, one thing that we're very cognizant of uh, is, is this emissions question. Given that we're partnered with the World Wildlife Fund um, and a number of other impact organizations around the world, we are extremely conscientious of, of the emissions mm -hmm. question. So everything we do is on a layer two solution called Polygon, which is on mm -hmm. Ethereum and reduces, it turns it to proof of stake. Um, but it's, 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 it's essentially on top of Ethereum as they call it layer two. Again, my background's in international development. I'm not a tech guy. I do the best I can, but <laughs> that's about it. Now, one thing as well that kind of gets thrown in the mix, which I don't think is quite fair, is that mining a Bitcoin is not minting an NFT. They're two very different things. And I think what people see all the time is that, you know, you've got a 60,000 server farm in China that's running off coal and mining Bitcoin and that's bad. It's horrible. Don't get me wrong. Yes. But I can't remember the exact statistic, but pretty much any of the new miners that are coming out of, you know, North America are all renewable energy. There's, there's zero incentive to actually have, um, you know, costly, uh, um, you know, fossil fuel type, type mining systems. But again, that's separate from an NFT, but they get lumped in. So I think that one of the things that is going to be key moving the space forward is that we have to change the narrative and we have to make sure that we can wade through um, a lot of the nonsense. And I always tell people as well, it's like, if I can, let's, let's say about a thousand NFTs on Ethereum would be equivalent to about a cruise ship traveling 20 kilometers. If I could raise, you know, $2 million to, to, to rehabilitate endangered rhinos that were victims of poaching, uh, be a wonderful group called Remembering Wildlife um, or Saving the Survivors, sorry. Would I, would I not do that because a cruise ship traveled 20 kilometers, right? There's a cost benefit analysis to be, to be measured here, right? In the space. So we are, we are also of that opinion that, you know, the world is losing 150 species a day. You know, we've got less than seven years towards the tipping point. Money needs to be motivated now. And, you know, there's incentivization factors that can be created for, for all parties via NFTs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you're talking about changing the narrative and, you know, obviously there's a, a, you know, increasing scrutiny uh, in the NFT world and um, in crypto. How do you kind of change that? I, I mean, you talked about bringing in more renewable energy, but how do you kind of ensure that um, the minting process or uh, that is more, that can be environmentally considerate or even like climate positive, as you mentioned before? Yeah, so... So there's a number of ways. So I, I can't speak fully to it because uh, it, it's certainly not my domain, but we are heavily involved with something called the Sustainable Bitcoin Standard, where we're mm -hmm. actually looking to measure and weigh each different cryptocurrency uh, based upon what its actual ecological impact was from creation to, to endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, there is, again, all the NFTs that we mint are on Polygon. So essentially the emissions question is moot. Um, it's the same as creating a credit card transaction. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, we do work with a number of partners that still want to mint on Ethereum, which has higher gas fees. And the reason for that is that that's where the money is. You know, most of the collectors still live on Ethereum and until there's more mass adoption elsewhere, that's just the way it is. So what we do is we have contracts that can actually track a 25 year lifespan of that NFT. What would be the approximate emissions within, you know, an 80% accuracy range. And then we offset that, not to the tune of neutrality, but to the tune of carbon negative. Now, a lot of people might say, well, you're just you know, stealing from Peter to pay Paul. But again, I ask the question, if this is money that can help keep the lights on for an organization that's doing vital work to save an endangered species, uh, and we're also putting money in the pockets of these incredibly valuable, you know, Vera or gold standard certified projects, carbon offset projects, then is this not you know, the least of all evils? And mm -hmm. another thing I will say about this is that um, you know, a couple of mean tweets from Elon made Ethereum 2.0 go up a year and a half in schedule. You know what I mean? Like the blockchain space is incredibly innovative. What is true one week is not true the next. 
Um, and I, I always find it a little bit, not funny, but you know, he makes you raise an eyebrow that does your, has your bank fully diversified from fossil fuels yet? Have a lot of these cr critics done their job, their due diligence and their job, you know, even though they've known about climate change since the fifties and seventies, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like we're, we're adapting as fast as we can, but at the same time, uh, it's, it, we're, there's also the, the disadvantage of being entirely trackable. I think one of the things about blockchain is that you can trace and calculate and count to a very high accuracy range, what the emissions profile will be. So it's kind of like a blessing and a curse, right? It's very mm -hmm. hard for us to say, well, what's the emissions pattern of um, you know, this Zoom call? I do know that if you turn your video off, they say it's 99% less emissions. So that's mm -hmm. the excuse I always use in the morning for turning my camera <laughs> off, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like these are yeah. the things, right? So we kind of have to, we have to acknowledge that there's gonna be an emissions cost for everything we do. You know, breathing creates carbon dioxide. So it's just like, what is, what is the trade-off here, right? And mm -hmm. I think that um, between a year and a half ago and now when we started, exponentially different space when it comes to being cognizant of the emissions question. And mm -hmm. there are always um, you know, platforms and solutions out there where you can find your community, make your money that don't uh, you know, create these kind of emissions. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the, the discussions around carbon offsetting, obviously like you know, Greta Thunberg recently highlighted that, oh, you know, carbon offsetting is kind of a form of greenwashing. How, what do you kind of say to that uh, around that discussion? I think, I think it's a start. Right. Obviously, there is no substitute for companies uh, cutting their emissions, reducing their emissions or, you know, changing it at the source or, you know, even carbon drawdown right out of the atmosphere. Um, but I do think that it's a bit naive to think that it doesn't help. Right. I mean, I can't remember the exact statistics. I wish Max was here. He could tell you. But, um, you know, one of the biggest bang for your bucks in terms of a carbon offset would be a biodigester and then a solar lamp or a clean cook stove. These are things that have you know, a massive impact, not only in the emissions question, but in people's lives. You know, if we're mobilizing hundreds of millions of dollars for the voluntary carbon offset market, and people are cognizant of tracking their own emissions, and then, you know, trying to offset them or trying to do better, it's a start. I mean, this is not, there's no silver bullet. It is going to take a hundred solutions, if not a thousand, mm -hmm. if not a million, whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I am somewhat I'm not apt to sit on a soapbox very often and say, well, you know, wag your finger. Do I think that carbon offsetting in the compliance market for major industry is often used as a, as a you know, a bit of a, a tool? Sure, that I do. Mm -hmm. But I do, I think that, you know, an individual putting 500 bucks a year into a voluntary carbon offset that can put, you know, 50 solar lamps for refugees in North Africa that have an actual emissions trait, like, you know, trackable emissions drawdown. That's a good thing. I don't see why that's a bad thing, right? It's yeah. mobilizing resources, finding different incentivization structures for people, and just trying to get the job done. Because at the end of the day, I think we've learned by now that altruism is not the motivating factor for people to change. I wish it was. It's not. People aren't going to do what's right because it's right. To, the, mm -hmm. to, to a large degree. There are many that do, but you know what I mean? There needs to be other factors and other tools in play. Mm -hmm. Well, let's kind of go more specific with uh, your work and how you, you guys, your team uses carbon offsetting and what kind of uh, projects that you support when you uh, mint or uh, sell these NFTs. So the very first project that we did was partner with the World Wildlife Fund Panda Labs, which is their innovation wing sort of that takes chances on new innovative technology and, you know, tries to turn local communities into conservationists themselves. So the first project we did was with WWF Romania where they have been working since 2014 to reintroduce the endangered European bison back into the wild. It went extinct in Europe in 1920 and it's Europe's largest land mammal, but um, they actually have seen incredible success since 2014, whereby there's now the largest uh, buffalo herd uh, in 200 years in Romania. And so now they're actually working with um, these farmers and these hunters and these trappers that have been living the same way they have been for you know, eons, uh, deep in the Carpathian wilderness. And you know, listening to the stories of uh, of, of the of the crew from WWF Romania is always fascinating because you know they're deep in the woods trying to teach these very you know veterans of the Cold War that uh, you know you, how can you change your lifestyle to be conservationists instead of you know hunters and trappers and mm -hmm. they've seen incredible success helping them share in the opportunities that come with conservation giving them the tools the resources the technology to become you know first line data collectors for better wildlife and forestry management they now know the birthing patterns of half the animals in the forest and when to hunt when not to hunt how to keep each other accountable. So that's the first project that we supported. We've also supported uh, NFT Gamer Pass project where, you know, $50 a pop and that gives you access to a metaverse game where 30% of the revenue went to 
um, fund uh, building nests for this endangered South African penguin. We've supported a project called Snarky Sharks, which was we did all the carbon offsetting for. Um, then we again, we gave them a report with a contract to analyze it. And then we went not only neutral, we went negative. And then uh, their project is helping support cleaning up underwater munitions off the coast of Hawaii that were dumped after World War II, which are actually giving mm -hmm. sharks cancer. Um, we've facilitated the relocation of uh, four endangered leopards. Next year, hopefully, we'll be doing 75 giraffe. Um, this is in Africa. We mm -hmm. have supported the National Eye Conservancy, which is an indigenous owned and operated nature conservancy in Kenya. I've worked with them for many, many years. They're an incredible, incredible group. They actually won the uh, UN Equator Prize for Biodiversity last year. Um, oh, wow. they, they've, they're incorporating local indigenous knowledge with modern science, and they've seen a 75% increase in wildlife in their territory. And at the same time, they're supporting primary schools, the Maasai Mara's First Library, a community center, a cultural preservation center, uh, women's economic empowerment, river restoration, anti-female gender relation campaigns, everything under the sun. I love them with all my heart. They're fantastic. That's called the National Light Conservancy. Uh, who else we got? There's more. <laughs> Earth.org. <laughs> we're working with you guys right now yeah. to help get uh, your NFT sold. And again, those are on Polygon. So 99.8% less emissions. Again, this call is worse for emissions than, than the minting of that tool. So there are no shortage of causes and amazing people that are trying to do wonderful things in this space. And moving forward, we're actually going to be launching a new website um, which will facilitate the investment into new projects that we believe in. So we will have you know, a number of services that we can provide an organization and then they can come on and actually get early supporters via tokenization. So mm -hmm. I think the reason and the need for that is that I speak at least four or five times a week with a new person who's doing you know, the most incredible, innovative, cool work on the ground. And yet they just don't, uh, they don't necessarily have the resources, the funds or the network to, you know, to, get it, to, to get out in the field and continue doing the work. If, mm -hmm. if an ecologist is spending two thirds of their time fundraising, that's a problem for me. And I would like to see that NFTs offer you know, a sustainable source of revenue, which also doesn't come attached with you know, the vanity projects that a lot of rich donors like to have, right? I was speaking with somebody from the Jane Goodall Foundation. He was saying, you know, somebody gives us $2 million and also a 400 point checklist. And then at the end of the day, he doesn't know what the heck he's talking about when it comes to sustainability yeah. you know, or to come, when it comes to, you know, how to properly run a, you know, a project that creates systemic change. And then it kind of, you know, falls by the wayside. So this is a way for the money to have, be entirely controlled by the organization mm -hmm. itself, as well as the narrative that is created through the art itself. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to highlight something you said earlier, which is uh, you managed to do something carbon negative. Um, can you kind of explain a little bit more and how that actually uh, come about? Yeah, so basically there are projects whereby we like to do like a 5x negative. So whatever the, the calculation would be on their carbon footprint, we'll go overboard and then go carbon negative via offsets to the tune of 5x. And then if some of them, some of the projects we also still do on Polygon, so they don't necessarily even need to do carbon offsetting, but they'll still put a portion back. We have another project that's launching um, in December with a group called the Edge of NFT Podcast. It's a very prominent podcast. And their NFTs will be planting, I think it's upwards of 150,000 or maybe 500,000 trees. Um, and so this is a project that obviously will have you know, generations of impact when it comes to emissions drawdown, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that would, be, that would be something that we're going to offset um, I think we're going to offset 500 tons of carbon, which it should only should not be more than a thousand tons of carbon to begin with, or sorry, mm -hmm. hundred tons of carbon to begin with. So we're going to offset 500 and then we're also going to plant 500 trees. So I would be willing to wager that that would be carbon negative in the grand scheme of things. Interesting. Um, so before we kind of go deeper about uh, Project Arc and the work that you do, uh, let's kind of go back to you and kind of do a little bit of introduction actually and um, you know how did you actually get into the world of nfts is it something you're always been familiar with and was there kind of a surprising avenue that you managed to go down into yeah no not at all i am not a tech guy i didn't know anything i was somewhat cynical about the space like many many other people are i i i didn't understand it right and i think uh well my background is predominantly in international development so i spent a lot of time working with indigenous communities here in canada I spent time in, uh, in Sri Lanka, working with women in the free trade garment sector after the Civil War. I worked in Kenya with uh, entrepreneurs whose products and services benefited young women. I did my master's in the UK. Um, it's basically, I've never thought that I would be involved in blockchain, but mm -hmm. uh, a, a gentleman who I had met five years ago named Max Song, who's our CEO, I met him at a conference in Kenya. We very much hit it off, but I knew 
I knew that he was the type of guy that, you know, you had to keep in touch with. And lo and behold, about, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, I got a call and he was saying, you know, I've got this project. I'm working on this. What do you want to do? I said, I'm on board. And then, you know, here we are. And so what I have learned since then is that um, this is a means to an end. I am of the belief that most people in this world want to be a part of something greater than themselves. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know how to do it. I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed by the amount of everybody's got a problem. Everybody's got a cause. And a lot of times you say, okay, well, what the heck can I do? Right. Mm -hmm. And donating money often feels like it stops at the, at the swipe of the credit card. It doesn't, you know, you might get a newsletter, you might get a, you know, a, a, a postcard, but that doesn't feel like you're connected to the impact. And what NFTs can do is from start to finish for years and years and years, you're part of a community that can be giving you access to experiences, to, you know, meet and greets, to, you know, metaverse, to games, to, to something. And not, not to mention, you're also getting something that you can give back and get your money back, right? So it's like, it turns a cost center into a revenue generating center. And then it also turns it into a constant feedback loop of what is the actual outcome on the ground? How am I learning and, 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 and contributing to the community in which we're helping? So I mm -hmm. just think that it really changes the game in terms of people's uh, ability to stay involved to feel like they're, they got skin in the game and like they're a part of this fight and, uh, and be rewarded for doing so. Mm -hmm. I am curious, is there any reason why you wanna focus on NFT as a way to fundraise for charities? Uh, why not use traditional art instead? What is the attraction to this kind of uh, world of NFT? So we do both. Um, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of NFTs can be tied to physical items. Uh, Jabu is a wonderful artist who we've been working now for a couple for the last month or so. Um, he's sold pieces to celebrities, uh, you know, head, heads of state. He's a phenomenal fine artist, and you can NFT and create that the, the digital contract that represents the physical piece itself. Now, mm -hmm. here's the other thing though about just selling physical art. Physical art is often that donation piece, right? I sold it. Here's the money goodbye mm -hmm. and that's the end of it right the nft yeah. acts as your membership pass it's your lifetime access pass it's if you ever want to walk, log into that discord if you want to go into the metaverse if you want to you know be a part of those experiences that is the tool that will give you access to those events right mm -hmm. so again it's it's about creating a, a a repeating experience and people to come back because um like if i'll put it to you this way if if i sell a piece of art and then five years later it turns out that something horrible has gone wrong in the ground there was a drought or, or, you know, we have a coral reef and it bleached. I'm not mm -hmm. really going to know about that unless I read my email five years later, right? I'm not, yeah. I'm just not going to be attached to it. But if I'm engaged yeah. in this community, I'm going to know right away and I'm going to feel motivated and galvanized to, to do more, to get back mm -hmm. involved, right? And so it's more about creating, again, that concept of community around these events. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, Project Art is, uh, we mentioned earlier in the introduction, it is basically a marketplace where people can sell and buy um, NFT artworks. Uh, can you kind of let me talk a little bit more about your role with it and what you kind of contribute with uh, when you kind of reach out with projects and, uh, and NGOs as well? So originally our thought process was we wanted to be a marketplace, um, mm -hmm. but as we have learned, there's no sense in going up in competition with the multi-billion dollar you know, platforms of the world. It just doesn't yeah. make sense. So what we are is actually we're platform agnostic. If somebody out there wants to work for positive change, whether it be social, animal, environmental, we're game. Let's let's make that partnership happen. Let's facilitate the connections with the impact organizations, co-create a project, find the artist, and then take it to market. Um, what we are launching uh, in the upcoming uh, month is Arc Labs, which will be that launch, or sorry, Arc Launchpad, which will be, you know, again, that, that tool for which organizations around the world can come on board, find the early supporters, take it to market, and, and then find their, you know, help in guiding through the process of launching NFT. So that, that launch pad is more about facilitating wonderful projects to go to market and providing them with, you know, that sort of white glove service as well as early investment structure. Um, Arc Studios will be, um, you know, helping with our own personal projects, things that we're very passionate about that we want to take to market. Um, we've got the launch of our own 10K project called Arcanauts in January, which will act as a um, you know, your lifetime membership pass to everything that we do in the future and all of the wonderful partners that we bring on board. Um, and then there's also Arc Labs, which will be, you know, sort of a 10 service. Uh, if you if you only need help with minting, we can help you with minting. If you only need help with, um, you know, finding community that's passionate about a cause, let's find that community. You know what I mean? It's whatever the case may be. So a lot of people have 
varying needs at that different stages and they sort of just need help. But the number one underlying ethos is that we're only going to work with people that are mission aligned that want to create positive impact in this space. Um, mm -hmm. That's it. That's all. Like we're not doing anything for, um, you know, money is not the, 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 mo the single most motivating factor. Obviously, we have to keep the lights on, but the number one goal is to balance that with what are our key pillars of impact and how are we going to measure that and how are we going to you know, create change. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're, we're heading. Uh, we also have a number of big projects in the pipeline, and I don't know how many details I'm allowed to give, but we will be working with a large consortium to actually use digital ownership to protect 800,000 square kilometers of land in a highly vulnerable area to make sure that the actual uh, natural resources stay in the ground mm -hmm. um, and that it's not dug up. Um, so this is a model that we hope will be fruitful and can be exported all over the world to the Amazon, to the Congo Basin, to wherever the case may be. So there's big projects like that. Um, and then we will also be working to create a, um, and this is a tough one to explain, but basically like a, um, a carbon offset marketplace via tokenization in on the blockchain, whereby it will actually increase sort of like what climate DAO is doing, but to a, to a greater extent, because there's utility involved having a number of partners that could actually trade and use cred in the digital world um, that is backed by actual carbon offsets and investment in green technology. Mm, interesting. So a lot, a lot happening in the next couple of months. Quite a bit, quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you, uh, you obviously work with a lot of different social impact and wildlife conserva uh, conservation organizations. So how do you kind of cultivate these relationships? How do you make sure uh, these organizations are the right ones to partner with? Or is there any red flags or things you want to avoid when you kind of uh, start making these connections? Well, yes and no. Like in regards to the red flags, I think that. There are some that have a wonderful, wonderful cause, but we know that we're just gonna be taking on too much in order to take it to market because there are some smaller organizations that, you know, if, if you have, you know, 500 Twitter followers and, and a very, and a wonderful cause, that's great, but it's very difficult to work for free um, mm -hmm. for, for, for X amount of time that it would take to find the artist, create the art, find, do the marketing, do the minting, uh, manage the community, all of that stuff. So I think more so it's about us being true to ourselves and realizing if, if until we reach that critical mass, we can't say yes to everything. I think mm -hmm. as with any startup, a lot of people do say yes to everything at the start and then it can get a bit muddied. And that's just the growing pains of any new organization. But yeah. the fact that we did partner with the WWF to begin with has certainly lended a lot of credence and reputability to you know what we're trying to do in the first place. And uh, I would say we don't even need to really do a lot of outbound. I, I mean, I, again, I get five emails a week from organizations that want to be, you know, want to get involved in the space. Now, that's why we facilitated the need for this new launch pad, whereby mm -hmm. I know that if we can, you know, build out a community via a couple of different projects succinctly, that once we have that motivated and mission aligned and ethos driven community that is passionate about the world, um, that we can start hosting these projects and getting them early stage investment. So just because we maybe aren't the ones to take them to market, that doesn't mean that somebody in our community who you know, has 100 ETH sitting around doesn't say, I love what you're doing. Here I am, I'm gonna support you. We wanna facilitate mm -hmm. those transactions. Like I think the key to the blockchain space is the term radical collaboration. Like that's what it is. It's you are only two connections away from somebody that you need to be in touch with to get the work done that you need to get done. And I think that that is, again, it's it's the great unifier like it's 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 a it's a way in which we can facilitate the you know not only you know physical like capital like money but but human capital right the mm -hmm. sharing of this knowledge and resources and people getting involved is something that we really want to help facilitate um so yeah it's uh it's there's also the optics question um mm -hmm. you know there are organizations like i you know, somebody had told me, well, do you want to, do you want to get in touch with Carol Baskin from Tiger King? I said, no, <laughs> I, do, I do not want to talk to a woman that yeah. is so steeped in controversy and roadside zoos as, yeah. you know what I mean? That's bad optics. So no, I would mm -hmm. not like to do that. But, but mm -hmm. that's an example that I, that's the only one on top of my head I can think of where I was like, hard no, <laughs> not doing that. Yeah, that is so funny. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so what about the other end of the spectrum uh, with the artists and NFT artists? Not probably not a lot of um, creatives are quite familiar with NFTs and the whole process of minting. How do you kind of approach or 
look for artists that has the same mission and ethos and or do you need to like pair up specifically uh different artists with specific uh, uh organizations what's the process like so there are i mean multiple different mediums right that you can be done in nfts there's people that do static images that do 3d animations there's people that do music there's there's no shortage of you know different mediums and creatives out there um, when when NFTs were booming last fall, there was there's an app called Clubhouse, which is mm -hmm. where anyone who was any everyone who was anyone in the creative space who wanted to even be interested in NFTs would go to Clubhouse. And so that was where we made a lot of our a lot of our friends. And I think I've spoken now to at least 300 artists, if not more. Um, and there's often no shortage of artists that want to tell a story that's important mm -hmm. and put money back in the pockets of organizations that are creating real change. Because I think that, I mean, the, the whole purpose of art, right, is to make people think or feel, right? It's something, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, but it's to invoke an emotion. And it's, it's, you know, it's uniquely human. And I think that lucky for us, you know, working with endangered species causes is kind of that, or, or even climate change, it's kind of one of those issues that doesn't have too many naysayers. There's not a lot of people I know, they're like, oh, I don't care about big cats, they can go die. Nobody says that, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no shortage of people that want to help that cause. And mm -hmm. so it's pretty, it's never hard to find artists that care. Now, the other thing is though, is that um, there are a, a lot of really amazing artists that are undiscovered and mm -hmm. they, they can produce the world's most beautiful NFT that it just could be amazing, but some doesn't always mean it's gonna sell. Simple mm -hmm. as that, right? Until we reach sort of this mass adoption stage, there are still quite a few NFT buyers that are money motivated versus altruism or access or utility motivated. Now that's changing by the day. That's not a universal truth. Um, but an artist with more provenance in the space who has an established community of collectors will nine times out of 10 do far better to partner with, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just kind of one of those things where you want to be fair to your early supporters and to the artists that have been a part of your community and you want to give opportunity to them. But at the same time, you know, if you really want something to be successful, it's it's always easier to find the Beeples of the world, or you know, the Sabets or the Warhoddles, whoever the case may be. Find mm -hmm. finding big guys is, but they're also busy. They're extremely busy yeah. now. <laughs> like every, yeah. they get hit up every two seconds for a new project. So, sure. um, I think I think one of the key things is that you need to create the hype machine, right? Mm -hmm. um, because to get big big money, you need to motivate those crypto kings that are that are only motivated by money. And if it gets tweeted about and talked about by 10,000 people, or if a celebrity is involved or, or a big name brand, then it kind of, it just gives you that oomph to get across the line. But again, I think we weather the storm now and in two years time, it's gonna be a whole different ball game. And we're gonna be best situated to be in that space, leading the space in this um, you know, animal environmental conservation angle. Um, so we just kind of got to take it on the nose for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that I think is going to really help uh, weather the storms of the collector market will be gamification. Gamers never run out of money. They always come back if they like a game. <laughs> They'll always <laughs> keep upgrading their character. It's just the nature of the beast, right? So okay. partnering with metaverses and gaming companies is, you know, we've got several uh, partnerships right now with AR, VR, award-winning game institutes that have created a lot of content for us. We've got partnerships with Decentraland, with Nemesis IO you know, bigger, um, you know, metaverses that, you know, can have that sort of online experience. And then the other thing that we're interested in is corporate social responsibility. I think mm -hmm. that every company right now wants to get involved in NFTs, not, not all of them know how to get involved in NFTs. And I also think that uh, if they were to attach a cause or, 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 or a mission alignment to it, they'll be far more mm -hmm. apt to be successful in the NFT space. Um, you know, one example of a project that I've been trying to push um, for example, I'll just say Nike as, as an example of a company that could do it. But what if Nike was to create the world's largest underwater Nike swoosh? They'll put up the money to build this and it turns into a living, breathing coral reef. So we have a partnership with a group called the Global Coalition and they could plant, you know, 20,000, uh, you know, climate change resistant uh, uh, pieces of coral. We NFT each one. Some are more rare than others. Some have never even existed before in human history because they're actually cross uh, splicing some of the genetics when they grow the coral. Now, as you plant these uh, coral on the reef, it's about two years before it starts to really, you know, bloom and look, look gorgeous from what I understand. But your art, your NFT art will actually grow and bloom and become more beautiful over time with that because we have contracts that we can create on chain that create what a quote unquote living art, you know, so not only will it inherently grow in value because 
it's becoming more beautiful. But at mm -hmm. the same time, if Nike puts up the money for this, they're going to allow all these 10,000 holders to have, you know, you're whitelisted for the next Jordan drop. You got 15% off. You get free access to our next Metaverse concert. Like it's instead of B2C, it's Web3 to C. You have direct connection to your, your customer. You have an engaged community that has skin in the game over the course of time. And then, you know, that $250,000 you used to build that swoosh, you're going to make five, 10 million. Now, are you going to keep that money? Probably not cool to do so. You should probably give it back to the project and just keep cycling forward the love. But, yeah. you know, you could shoot commercials at this thing. You can dive, you can do giveaways. This is a this is a win-win-win scenario for everybody. And like, that's the kind of example of a corporate social responsibility project in the NFT space that we would like to see happen. Mm -hmm. I am curious, um, logistically, has, uh, has it been difficult for charities to get their money converted back to something that they can use? So I understand probably most charities are not very familiar with cryptocurrency and all that. So we actually have a partnership with uh, Nuve, uh, which mm -hmm. was bought by uh, Simplex. And we, uh, we can do credit card transactions now. So people can uh, essentially buy with their credit card and then it settles in crypto. And we also have the, the ability to uh, put, put that money back into fiat, into the accounts. There's know your client rules with, with uh, um, donations for you know, conservation organizations or any, any or NGO. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very, we're very cognizant of that. And then there's also tax implications. So mm -hmm. we, we, it is a problem that we have not a problem, a solution, a challenge that we have been coming up with mm -hmm. solutions for and working hard, diligently to do. Now, that being said, I think it's, it's been surprising to me to see how many impact organizations are already exploring. How do I accept crypto? How do I accept mm -hmm. crypto? Because there are so many tools out there to, to grow your donations, you know, 10 X. So what are the possibilities of actually having, you know, your donation make money before you are even able to spend it? And mm -hmm. then there's the concept of a DAO, which is called the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. I think this is going to be all like this thing is going to change the game for decentralized finance. But what if we were to have all these donations, you know, to the tune of, you know, a million dollars, five million dollars that gets you, you know, 20 percent return via safe investments every year? Um, and then you can actually have this massive pool of liquidity that has, you know, governance systems in place where the people can own it, where people can have, you know, say in how the money is spent and, and what, what, what causes it goes to help. But actually you, you can, you will literally have, you know, these, these DAOs all around the world, I'd imagine in 10 years that are ex explicitly dedicated to massive causes. So with mm -hmm. these groups, you know, these roving, you know, uh, uh, DAOs of, you know, high liquidity, they're going to be huge finance investment tools for impact organizations. So mm -hmm. again, I, I, I know it's a, it's a tough place almost because the regulation doesn't exist everywhere, but mm -hmm. the regulation will come, the dust will settle and the, and the major players and the tools will come out. And I'd imagine in five years, every you know, NGO on earth will have a, a Bitcoin button or an Ethereum button or whatever they, or heck they're even their own token. You know what I mean? Like their mm -hmm. own form of currency that, you know, is directly tied to the proof of good that they have on the ground. Mm -hmm. So do you think NFT is going to be the future for fundraising for charities? I think it's going to be a big deal. I really do. Yeah. Like, I really do. Like, if I had a nickel for every horror story, I had to hear about, you know, some rich guy's donation or, you know, we were fighting for that next $10,000 grant and we lost it to an organization that does the same thing as us 10 blocks over. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's such a competitive space. And especially with COVID, you, know, you haven't been able to hold fundraisers. You haven't, you know, money's, money's tight. Are we heading for an economic, you know, collapse? Like, it's, 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 it's scary to have to worry about where your next round of funding is, but mm. it'd be awesome to log on every day. And, you know, just like you have your fundraising manager, you have your discord community manager. They log on and say, Hey, 10,000 guys who support us. Here's what we're working on today. Here's some pictures from the field. Here's, we're going to organize a meeting with the local, um, you know, tribesman that we, who is going to, you know, talk about, you know, his experience uh, over the last year fighting climate change. Whatever the case may be, you can provide a digital experience to people that will keep the money flowing. And then at the mm -hmm. same time, you can provide them with a piece of art or, or, you know, again, this access pass that grows in value that can get them money back. So if somebody says, OK, well, you know, I, I'm really passionate about this cause, but I, you know, I'm getting married. I need to make some money. Well, I'll, I'll sell it to someone in that there in the community. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's there's opportunity here, I think, to to create real passion and to galvanize support around things. And rather than just simply, you know, try to come up with the next commercial that, you know, I, I, I always think back to those, I don't know if anyone here is from the US or Canada, but Sarah McLaughlin used to do these two minute Humane Society commercials and it was just remember, dogs in cages. Yeah. And you felt so guilty, so <laughs> sad. You're just like, okay, 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 take my money. But like, you know, we could do better, we could do better. Why? We could, we could provide an, a, an augmented reality app 
where you can scan your your pet, have it in AR, drop it in the metaverse, and then you know 20% of all the money that's spent just to download that file will go to your local humane society. Wouldn't that mm -hmm. be a cooler thing, you know, to, to get money out of people? We've yeah. got the technology, we're this close, so we're working on it. You know, these are the <laughs> things that, that we want to do. Aside from the technology and maybe like the, the conversion to fiat and everything, what are the, some, some of the other biggest challenges you have so far and where do you see it changing? Is it from, do we need to educate more with uh, the public and the other people or is it the, just the process of just getting things done? In my opinion, it is, it's the marketing, man. It's, it's the mm -hmm. marketing. It's like, you could have, again, I've got pieces of art that were supporting that, but like, uh, you know, the project with the Buffalo where he actually took the topographical mountain range, molded it into the fur, where the song actually incorporates local traditional Romanian instruments and uses plant wave technology that recorded the biorhythm of a plant to decide how to play those drums in the NFT itself. And I'm like, this mm -hmm. is cool art, but unless I have a community of people that find value in it, it's it's hard to sell, right? And so, mm -hmm. so we are getting, we are, we are a far bigger beast than we were um you know a year and a half ago and he, when mm -hmm. i was down in miami art basel last week it's like i gotta i still got a 150 business cards i gotta keep the emails pumping out with people are like i love it how do i get involved i yeah. think the number one you know name of the game is just spread the word spread the word spread the word talk about the utility talk about the access talk about you know this isn't just a jpeg it's so much more it is a lifetime membership to the cause the community and the people that come with it you know what I mean? And yeah. anyone who gets in now, I promise you in five years, 10 years, you're going to be the OG who looks back and gets all of this access to the wonderful things. Like I, again, I know uh, metaverse concerts are going to be all the rage. I know tons and tons and tons of celebrities that are going to be doing mm -hmm. this. And so, you know, like there's, 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 there's real, there's real access to be had here and real change to be created. We just need to, uh, to show people that this isn't as, as silly as it may look on the face right at the start, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm just gonna ask you this one last question before I open up the question to, to the public. Um, so you actually helped host uh, a couple of NFT art exhibitions and, and auctions in Hong Kong here and just recently in Miami. What's, been the, what's the response been like? Um, was, have you, do you wanna share any like successful cases or examples that we like to know? Yeah, yeah. Well, we sold Earth.org's uh, NFT, yeah. one, of, one of the three there at the event at Soho. Um, that, that picture was one of the award-winning photographs uh, from, you know, amateur photographers that had sent it in. I, I, those pieces were incredibly impactful, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it, they almost didn't look real, right? The, the three yeah. photos. I don't know if you guys can share them with the community later, but um, they almost don't look real. And uh, I, it was actually myself that did the animated art on it for the next three that we're looking to sell up at the event that we have this week. Um, but, but I think that the interest was huge. Mm -hmm. The, the friction to buy an NFT is still there, right? It's yeah. like, not everybody knows what the heck's a MetaMask wallet. How do I set that up? Okay. Well, how do I buy crypto? And then, you know what I mean? Like they the process of creating a more frictionless intuitive UI is something that is like paramount for us and for every organization in this space. So I think that one thing that was really exciting for us was that everybody who walked through those doors, you know, the couple thousand that did was extremely excited about the concept of what we're doing. They walked out of there knowing a lot more about the space and people that have never bought an NFT before says, okay, how do I buy it? I want in. So that's crucial. This mm -hmm. is the, to us, that, that was a learning exercise for both us and everyone in the space. And I think even for a lot of fine artists, I mean, we, we talked to a collective of extremely famous and popular fine artists in Mexico. And they were like, we love it. How do we get involved? How do we you know, make our NFT? So we, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of guidance that needs to come through the process. And with that comes you know, sleepless nights and time and money and all, the, all those things. But, but again, this is the struggle that we have to do now to make the space thrive later. Crypto yeah. has always been, and blockchain has always been something for you know, the nerd and the computer programmer and the person, I don't like the word nerd. I, I, my kid's going to be a nerd. I love making, I love, I love reading. I love, I love learning. So, mm -hmm. but, but you know what I mean? Like that's, that's, that's the ethos. It, it was, it was not meant for the everyday person, but the more that we make this acceptable and easy to use for the common man, the more that we're going to get people in that space and the more money that we're going to raise and put in the pockets of organizations that are creating a change. Simple as that. So mm -hmm. Soho House was a very successful event in our mind. We've got another one this week uh, with the Impact NFT Alliance. And uh, we haven't touched on that yet. I'll just briefly explain. The Impact NFT oh. Alliance is going to be a consortium of Web3 actors 
DAOs, studios, uh, media creators, payment processors, anyone that could be involved in NFTs or blockchain, if they want to see this space grow and the utility for creating real animal, environmental, or social change, predominantly towards the sustainable development goals, then mm -hmm. let's all put our heads together, create a central repository for the tips, tricks, tools, events, uh, network for all the good actors in the space. Because mm -hmm. I think as with any organization, when they enter the space, it's just like, it's like drinking water through a fire hose. There's so much information that comes at you. You don't know what the heck's true, who's a good actor, who's bad or who's not. But mm -hmm. we want to make impact NFT common nomenclature in the space. We're the number 10, there were top 10 searches on Google for it. We want to keep it that way. So if somebody gets in the space and says, how do I use NFTs to create change? They're going to find us. They're going to find our partners. They're going to find our tools. They're going to find our resources. They're going to call us. Or we're going to say, you need to talk to this person, talk to that person, this person, this person. And here's how we're going to change the world. That's what yeah. it is. We want to be the central hub that has, you know, again, that term radical collaboration where everybody's going to have skin in the game and we're going to co-create this and change change the the adoption rate for 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 nfts that's really exciting to hear i'm um, looking forward to it um so let's get to our first uh questions um what is your most exciting nft project you worked on so far hmm. to to me the one that i'm excited about is the relocation of endangered species mm. um the the group that we had worked with initially for this was uh peace parks foundation they're the largest mm -hmm. conservation area in Africa. They are partnered with, um, well, it was started by Nelson Mandela and the former Prince of Luxembourg, but they actually rehabilitate land that is not only resource driven, but war torn. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, this civil war in Central and Southern Africa, um, the land that is, was, you know, ravaged by it, they have rehabilitated and then they bring back, you know, the big five, sorry, two seconds, Hannah, would you be able to uh, put the dog up, please? And thank you. Um, my Doberman, sorry. she's, uh, she's yeah. a real, real pain in my butt. But, um, but nonetheless, so, so next year, if we were to relocate, you know, 75 giraffe, um, telling the story of what that looks like, this is the largest relocation of endangered species ever in human history. Picture, mm -hmm. you know, 75 trucks going down the side of a mountain. That's a pretty crazy endeavor. And one thing that we learned is that the reason that they're looking at NFTs for funding these relocations is they're risky and companies or donors don't want to be attached to a, a, a failed project. What happens mm -hmm. if five of the drafts react badly to anesthetic or the road collapses on the hillside and the truck goes down? And then they said, OK, well, you know, X, Y and Z company paid for this. And it's like, oh, that's that doesn't look good optically. Right. Yeah. So yeah. so we didn't know. We didn't ever, we never thought of that. We're like, really? Why would nobody want to support this? They're like, well, what if go, shit goes wrong? We're like, uh oh, yeah. so we can we can support this. But it tied into that utility, you know, what if you can name the animal, you can learn its characteristics, you could track its tag, you could, you know, get a free visit to the park, you know, there's all of this stuff you could bake into it, where people could feel like, that's my guy, that's my animal, I'm gonna, or even you could sell 100 NFTs to pay for one animal, you could fractionally own it, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there, and I say ownership, maybe isn't the best word, adopt it, right, adopt it to support it for its life. I think that that is a cool one, because uh, I've I've lived in Kenya for for well over a year, and uh, there's nothing more powerful and majestic like than seeing the big five out there on the Masai Mara. And a lot of people will never have the funds or the, the you know the ability to go do that. But everybody every, everybody everybody's affected when you see one of these animals roaming, right? Like everybody mm -hmm. it feels it. Like this is this is ancient. This is this is cool. And I think if we could bring that to people via the metaverse, via the digital space and help them feel like they got skin in the game to really protect these things, I think mm -hmm. that's a really cool experience for people. Excellent. Um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, the NFT space changes so quickly and moves so rapidly. Um, a question here we want to ask is like, um, what kind of trends do you see emerging next? Oh, well, obviously the metaverse. I mean, since Facebook did that, I mean, it's blown up and everybody's got a meme about it. Um, I am of the opinion that gaming is going to be the big one. Oh yeah. The way that Axie Infinity has changed opportunity for people in the developing world is crazy. People mm -hmm. are now able to make more money playing a crypto game than they could by finding a job that is, you know, what would they be considered like middle income? That's pretty mm -hmm. crazy. Like the, that is insane for, for people to actually be able to make a livelihood and thrive by, yeah. by a crypto play to earn game. Now, what happens if we had a play to earn game where portions of that fund went directly back into the conservation? You know how many people spent hundreds of millions of dollars on Farmville on Facebook? 
well, what if we had our metaverse conservation area where you have to find your 30 people, you have to steward the environment, you have to interview with real indigenous leaders, real modern scientists in the metaverse, you have to learn new things, you've got to pay to, to you know, well, you can pay or it's free, whatever the model will be, but actually, you know, steward this, this, this digital plot of land that will have direct impact on a physical plot of land and people can follow that change over time. So mm -hmm. I think that gamification is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the biggest things is just that blockchain games have been very, not childish, but they haven't been, you know, obviously like an Xbox or a PlayStation, but I will say this, X Sony, Microsoft, and Unreal Engine have been teamed up for years to build a gaming metaverse. So Xbox and oh, PlayStation wow. finally put aside their battles to, to partner with the, the best 3D rendering PC platform. That's going to be one heck of a platform. <laughs> you know what I mean, I haven't <laughs> seen it. I don't know who has seen it, but you know that's going to be good. So these are the things that I do believe are going to be a big change. And then the other is, uh, you know, avatars and, you know, digital identity. Mm -hmm. Having your, your digital person, you know, it could be a T-Rex for all you know. Who cares? It doesn't have to be a person. It could be whatever. But that identity being represented across platform. I think mm -hmm. that the, the writing is on the wall that no longer can a monopolization of any one service be the, be the way. I think the blockchain companies are going to say, well, we're all going to make more money if we create one big marketplace. So mm -hmm. I think that as that comes and as mass adoption comes, you know, the digital identity is going to be a big, a big uh, trend as well. Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure if you read news recently that uh, Sweden uh, proposed uh, talking about banning cryptocurrency mining. Obviously, this is to do with traditional conventional mining. But do you think this affects kind of uh, the impact NFT world? Or is it something that links back to what you said before, trying to change that narrative and changing that uh, on the policy stage anyways? So I, so I think that it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's, it's a complex question, right? Um, mm -hmm. Does it affect it? Yes. Because what happens when China says they're banning like crypto markets tank, right? I mean, they've done it like 10 times, but what always kind of gets me is that what's the end game for these companies? Like the federal reserve is toyed with making a cryptocurrency. China wants to make mm -hmm. its own cryptocurrency. Is this another form of the government saying, uh, not for you, it's for me, you know, like they're just trying to take, take that control back. And I don't like that. So I think mm -hmm. that that's a bit, uh, that's a question to be raised. Now, however, Sweden's often been a good actor on the international stage, so I'd be willing to wager that this is about emissions. And if it is about emissions, then yes. If your crypto mine is running off of a non-renewable resource, shouldn't I am of the opinion that that should be phased out, and it will be phased out. I mean, mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense financially either, right? Why would yeah. I keep paying for you know coal or, or you know increasing prices on the grid when I can just have a massive solar farm? That's why almost all the new Bitcoin miners that are coming out are in Texas, because there's a lot of sun in Texas. So yeah. <laughs> like some of the biggest miners in the world are 100% renewable. So I think that it's a, it's a complex question as with anything mm. that we face. And I, but I would be more willing to wager it's the concept of cryptocurrency that is disruptive to governments that they're upset about rather than the emissions. Because I never, you never saw them act so quick on all the other things they were creating emissions, right? I, again, I just feel like it's, it's painted as the boogeyman because it's an easy target. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin mining is not NFTs, is not Ethereum, is not Solana, is not all these other platforms. So um, does it affect it? Yes. Will we, will we be able to weather the storm? I believe so. NFTs are here to stay whether we like it or not. And anyone who wants to learn more about you know, the vision for the future, I, I encourage you to go watch Gary Vee. That guy's been predicting trends for a, a decade before each time. And Gary Vee is all in on NFTs. And when you listen to him explain it, he explains it far better than I. <laughs> Interesting. Definitely. We'll check it out. Um, so wait, this is a question that we asked all our guests uh, in the past. So it would be interesting to see kind of your stance on it. Um, you did mention earlier how COVID could potentially show how NFT could be a new way of fundraising. Do you think COVID itself is um, a way have, you know, let, made us change how we look at the environment, how we treat our wildlife and conservation and just basically change how we live our lives? Well, I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, Vitalik, the creator of Ethereum, gave, what was it, $1.9 billion in Shiba, Shiba coin to India for COVID relief. So India is currently mm -hmm. the largest you know, benefactor of crypto supporting COVID to the tune of a billion, over a billion dollars, almost mm -hmm. $2 billion. So, um, I mean, so, sorry, repeat the tail end of that question. I was just thinking about that point when you read it. Repeat the tail end of that question. Just basically, do you think um, COVID was a great reset in how we treat the environment? and just Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get into arguments so many times with my high school friends that, you know, are all because I live in the Western world. And I don't know about you guys, but the conspiracies run rampant. 
So <laughs> I, I often, they're always like the great reset. Well, this is just a global play. No, it's not. It gives us an opportunity. The only thing that has necessitated true change in human systems is crisis. The mm -hmm. old, like after World War II was a reset. The great stagflation of the 70s, they called it. And then neoliberalism came in, arguably not a great reset, but that was a reset. You know what I mean? Like the only time that humans make, especially in you know, democratic societies is when the crisis is right in your face. And the fact that COVID showed us, you know, we don't need to be driving to work. We don't need, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the garbage that, that, our, that our world has created um, means that we are presented with an opportunity to, to change our system, to change our supply chains, to, to figure out where, where, you know, where we can make real leaps and of change. Because I think one of the problems is that even for CEOs, the vast majority of CEOs are paid upon their, their stock's performance. Mm -hmm. And if your stock's performance is tied to short-term uh, decisions, not long-term real you know, change, then you're going to be motivated to make those sort of those, those decisions, which will make me more money now. But in five years, when I leave and go take another board member position, I'm not, I'm not incentivized to make real long lasting change. Now there's many mm -hmm. examples to the contrary. Some CEOs are, you know, incredibly motivated and they're, they're true stakeholders of the company and that's great. But at the end of the day, especially in the financial world, people are not motivated by long-term decision-making or sustainability. They're motivated by how do I 10 X now so I can go retire wherever the heck I want. Um, sure. I think that COVID has provided a wonderful opportunity to reflect on our system and where we can change it. And again, mm -hmm. when things are shut down, or when things are in collapse, it's a lot easier to sunset some industries and bring in new ones. So mm -hmm. it's a tough, hard change, but like, you know, nothing ever is. Any, anything truly, truly worth a damn in this world to change is not gonna be an easy slog because there are too many people that benefit from the status quo. And I think challenging the status quo requires not just dealing with the problem that is on the tip of the iceberg, it's those 150 other issues that are underneath the water that aren't necessarily as easily seen. Absolutely. Uh, we have one more question here. Um, does Project Art collaborate with Cardano NFT projects as well, or do you just focus on Ethereum and Polygon? No. So, like again, we are open uh, to anything and everything. So, our drop in January will be on Solana. Um, Cardano is a. There's a number of people that I've spoken with many times. We collaborate with Algorand. Um, anyone, anyone who wants to do the, like do the, do it. I'm I'm game. Like I I have no. Uh, obviously we prefer to work a proof of stake. That's a fact. You know what I mean? We, we just, because of the nature of our partnerships, we would be remiss not to try and, you know, keep our emissions way, way down versus having to do mm -hmm. the offsetting. But uh, we'll work with anyone and everyone who wants to create change. And the reason I think I say that is because we are all going to benefit when everybody benefits. If you're, if you're working on Cardano and I'm working on Tezos and we're both trying to save endangered species, we're not enemies. If we're both on Cardano and we're both trying to save an, an endangered species, we're not enemies. We are partners because mm -hmm. there is enough market share for everyone. We are so far from tapping into the full market share capabilities, right? So let's find that cause and that carrot to dangle for everyone to get involved in this space. And let's use whatever tool we have in our toolkit because we don't have time, man. Seven years, 150 species a day. Like let's yeah. put the money in the pockets now. Like this is just, a, it's another weapon. It's not the only weapon. It's another weapon that these organizations mm -hmm. have. Absolutely. Um, we're just about to hit the one hour mark. So I'm just going to ask you this one final question, which is, um, you know, whether is it through NFT, impact NFTs or other technology that will emerge later on, are you hopeful about us re finding a path to create a more sustainable future? How optimistic about are you about the future? <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I one, feel yeah. the ex existential dread everyone else does a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Here's, here's my opinion. Um, we're bombarded with information every day. And I think that because there is just this numbness to the craziness and sadness of the world that it washes over us, mm -hmm. I feel like NFTs, metaverse, VR, AR, and again, I, I use the word experiential. Like if you can really experience something, I mean, every time one of those Netflix documentaries comes out that really rock our world, what, I mean, yeah. we're just like, well, I got to do something about this immediately, right? But then you don't know how, and then there's another documentary, then you're outraged about something else. But if, if the metaverse, like, not everybody can buy an NFT, but everyone can see one. Not everyone can, you know, own a VR set, but you can still go and see these, these metaverses. But as this becomes more prevalent in people's lives, I am of the opinion that whether or not we sell one to you doesn't matter. It's whether or not we help you reflect on your role in the natural world. If we educate you, if we inspire you, if we create a little change, then that snowballs, right? 
And it's mm -hmm. those experiential, you know, art or just any anything like even if you go to a concert because you want to see Justin Bieber dance around in the metaverse and he start and we bring in a fireside chat for half an hour with the Nat Geo Explorer who talks about the plight of glaciers. You sat there and listened to it and maybe you know there's a there's a wonderful line from Tupac which I've always tried to live my life by which is I may not change the world but I guarantee I'll spark the mind that will right and so that's what I believe that our goal is to do here. We we're not going to get you know 500 billion dollars or trillion dollars in nfts sold and then just you know change it overnight but we can mm -hmm. create a cascading effect of people who are connected engaged motivated and trying to change things in whatever capacity they can so that's kind of where i believe nfts can can play that role mm -hmm. well on that lovely positive note um that brings an end to the evening uh thank you so much to everyone who joined us tonight and a big special thank you to john for being a guest tonight uh you've been very very helpful and enlightening about the world of nft um so where can people can follow some latest updates on on project arc so uh impactnft.org is where you can hear about the alliance mm -hmm. uh project-arc.co i think we're gonna have a new uh I think we're going to get that dash out of there because nobody likes to dash in a, in a, in a dot com. But uh, our new website is launching. Uh, what we can do is we I mean, we're part of with you guys. I'll share it with uh, Daniela or, or, or yourself, Olivia, and we can we can get it get it shared. But project dash work dash mm -hmm. arc dot co. But the best thing I'd encourage is go to at we are project arc on Twitter. The link tree is right there. It's the most updated. You can join our discord. You can stay up to date on everything we're doing. Uh, the big project that we have coming up, as I mentioned, is Arcanauts. Um, that's going to be a whole story of one 10,000 animated 3d animated characters from two, two factions. One of the conservationists, the almost like an indigenous tribe partnered with the, uh, you know, the, the technologists and the individualists of society. And they go around the metaverse stewarding and rehabilitating the environment. So we're mm -hmm. going to have a, a wonderful narrative that's created for years to come. Uh, surrounding that with a bunch of utility baked in so if you go to our discord you can learn it all there and stay up to date on what we're doing and if anyone has any questions concerns interests uh hit us up in the dms uh we're on them 24 7 there's 12 languages and 30 people in our company and uh somebody's always awake <laughs> with all the time zones <laughs> we work across so Fantastic. So everyone make sure to follow them on social media. And of course, please follow Eartha Org on Instagram, Twitter, and our website for all the latest updates as well. Um, so great to speak to, uh, speaking to you, John, and an absolute pleasure for everyone who has joined us. Uh, thank you, everyone. So stay safe. Good night. Take care, guys. Thank you.